and we're hosting this year's ninth annual LC Symposium. It's a big international conference every single year. This is the first time we're doing it online. And so we're excited to try something new, uh, both in that we'll be hosting the conference online and that the conference isn't gonna be just on a pure kind of traditional science topic. It's gonna be bridging the idea of, of looking at science and also thinking about how that interacts with society. Um, so I'm really excited because this is a very timely conference, I believe, with everything going on with COVID and kind of misinformation that you see circulating around uh, between kind of the general public and also how scientists have been reacting to that. So that's just one reason why I think that this is a really nice time to be having this type of discussion. This conference is super international, which is what we're really excited about. So it's very international and it's, it's meant to be inclusive no matter where you are in the world. So if you've noticed, we have these kind of three regions, Asia Pacific, the Americas and Europe slash Africa. And that isn't meant to uh, exclude anyone from those regions. It's just meant to highlight that those regions are uh, meant for you to participate in kind of during the normal workday, if, if that's where you're located. But you should feel free to participate in any of the talks, any of the keynotes, um, comment any of the sticky notes. Um, really everyone is meant to participate in everything as much as they want. We just wanna make it easy to, for people to participate in regions where they're based in. Um, you should have seen the code of conduct in the welcome email. So I just wanna briefly remind people that uh, this is an inclusive conference. We won't tolerate any kind of harassment or hate speech anything like that. Um, so just, you know, be respectful. Um, I also wanna take a moment to introduce you guys to the local organizing committee. So we kind of have three different organizing committees for the three different regions of the program. Um, and for the Japan organizing committee, that's me, that's uh, Hanako, Felina, Hiroyuki, Irina, and Emily. And so you'll see these people mentioned in Zoom. You'll probably see them participating. And if you need more contact information or details about any of the local organizing committee, please check the website. Um, do participate in the keynotes, panels and everything, participate in the platform. It's really meant to be participatory experience. Um, so just wanna remind people of that. Um, after this, we'll be jumping to the Q and A. And so those Q and A's correspond with keynote videos which have already been posted online. And so those are recorded keynote videos and the Q&A session is meant to be your responses or questions for the speakers based on those videos. And we'll show you a brief, just one minute summary of those videos beforehand for people that weren't able to watch the entire video before today's sessions. But you can watch those even after today's session's over. Um, after the Q&A session today, we'll have a mini breakout discussion. And so that'll just kind of be to get people familiar with the platform and how to talk to each other in these mini breakouts over Zoom. And Tuesday and Wednesday, we'll move into more in-depth discussions through breakouts. Um, and then Thursday, of course, we'll be talking to our panel and that should be a lot of fun. Um, so without further ado, let's jump in. And first we'll hear from former LC Executive Director, Mary Wojtek. Hi, I'm Mary Wojtek, the head of the astrobiology program at NASA. I'm also a member of the Earth and Life Sciences Institute community at Tokyo Tech and the former executive director of LC. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to the ninth annual LC Symposium entitled Science in Society. Science is a collective endeavor supported by society and for the benefit of society through the discovery that creates new knowledge, improves education, and contributes to the quality of our health and well being. Science addresses the mysteries of the universe and provides solutions to our needs in our everyday lives. This has been a great year and a challenging year for science and its relationship to society. JAXA, the Japanese space agency, select, successfully returned samples collected from a nearby asteroid that will tell us about the formation and early evolution of our solar system. The gene editing technique CRISPR was applied successfully to treat two debilitating, life-threatening blood diseases, including sickle cell anemia, offering hope to millions of people throughout the world. And of course, there's COVID. During the past year, COVID-19 has wreaked havoc across the world. Scientists have made unparalleled heroic strides to learn all they can about the virus's biology, how it's transmitted, its mode of infection, 
and identifying vulnerabilities that have led to the development of a number of vaccines currently available. All of this while struggling with translating fast accumulating evidence for the public as an audience not well versed in the process of science and stemming the dissemination of misinformation, bad science and misdirection. And of course, unfortunately, politics has played a role that has affected the trust in science and scientists and the trust in public health measures related to COVID-19. The topic of science and society couldn't be more relevant than today. The ELSI Symposium aims to address a variety of aspects of science and society, including the roles and responsibilities of the different actors and the expectation each has of the other actors in society. LC Symposium was put together by three teams of LC members across three time zones, making it truly a global inclusive experience. We have 600 participants registered, equally distributed across those time zones. Please participate as your schedule permits. Have a great week and thanks for joining. Just fantastic. Um, thank you very much to Mary for that rich introduction and also Harrison for setting the scene for today. Let's get started. Uh, much better that we uh, can start to engage in conversation right from the beginning. Uh, you'll see here we have our agenda nice and broad. Welcome. Consider yourselves welcomed. Uh, we're going to have the presentation q and a i'll explain what's going to happen in a second uh, we'll have a short break just so that we can refresh ourselves then as uh, harrison said we'll do the mini breakouts and then we'll close um, and invite you back obviously to see you tomorrow let me explain what we're going to do now i'm going to share my screen just to make it absolutely clear if i may because i want you to become familiar with KaiStorm as a platform um, you will have joined using the uh, welcome page here on KaiStorm. Well done for coming. And uh, we invite you to have a look in the left-hand bar at uh, the agenda for this day. So it's Monday and we're in the Asia Pacific reason, region. Uh, in a second, we're going to be going to this agenda item um, and you'll see that we have our four speakers lined up here. In a second, uh, we'll hear the one minute summary from Sai. So if you were to click on that page, on her page, you will see not only a short uh, biography, but also her full presentation, uh, which is for uh, about 30 minutes long. If you haven't re read it, uh, watched it already, uh, then we invite you to do that after this session and also a one minute summary, which we'll play in a second. At the bottom, we have already some really interesting questions. We invite you, if you're so inclined, to add questions of your own. You do that by clicking on the, um, uh, the little orange button with the plus sign in it at the bottom there, and you add your question just like this. Click the little arrow and it becomes live there. This is really nice way of working because it means everybody can see the questions that you're adding. We'll use this functionality a lot during the course of the next four days. So just to remind you, you start with the agenda for today. You find this item, which we're just about to start. Uh, you look at the speaker who is going to be uh, doing the Q&A, and, and if you have any questions for them, just add them here using the nice plus button. So, with no further ado, let us uh, play Sai's short one-minute summary video, and then Harrison, I think it would be great if you could introduce her and uh, moderate the Q&A. Emma, is that all right? Perfect. I will be sharing the video momentarily. Thanks, Toby. During and after a huge disaster, social capacity is overwhelmed and many risks increase simultaneously. In addition to this, 
Nuclear disaster and pandemic have much in common because in both disasters, fear against invisible risks may cause social havoc. In such situation, just technical knowledge and logical thinking may not be enough, and experts and residents should learn from each other. Because what people need and want to know during the disaster is not a truth, but a balance of risks. And talking about a balance is almost equivalent to talking about a life. I call it life communication. And life communication after a disaster is a precious opportunity for us experts to learn our own life. Thanks. So that was the one minute summary of, of Sayochi's talk. And um, we're really happy to have her here with us today for the Q&A. So I'm going to be reading questions from the KI Storm platform. Um, but if anyone has any questions that um, they haven't written yet or haven't thought of yet and that occurred to them, please just write it in the Zoom chat. It's probably the easiest way. So the first question, and you've already addressed some of these questions uh, by comments, which is really great, but we'll just reiterate them for the audience that's here today. So the first question by Hero is, I understand that experts should understand that science risk and life communication is a process not to give people decision, but to provide risk assessment of one aspect and decisions should be made by people by comparing it with other risks or concerns. However, I often see that people or even politicians ask experts to give decision or clear conclusions. For example, is it okay to eat foods from Fukushima? How will the number of COVID-19 cases change in the future? How should experts communicate with people in those cases in order to not go beyond what we can exactly say, but to keep their confidence simultaneously. I think you're muted. Oops. Is it okay? That's great. Yes. Thank you for this question. Yeah, I agree. Many people, especially in crisis settings, uh, prefer affirmative answer rather than uh, let's think about <laughs> this topic, etc. Because I think this is because they cannot make them uh, decision make them decision by themselves. And why people cannot make decision? That is partly because they cannot. Uh, understand or they do not know what their own value is. Because if they, for example, many people ask, can I live in Fukushima? And they actually think I want to live in Fukushima or I want to eat food in Fukushima. They may not, uh, they may not eat, um, think it's difficult to make a decision even before they uh, listen the answer of the experts. But they do not know what value they have. They cannot make decision. So first thing, I, I think first thing we should do is to make it clear what uh, is our own value or what we cannot uh, con Consider we cannot cons compromise, etc. So before uh, make making uh, affirmative answer, is this uh, can uh, is this uh, do this answer your question here? So he here is giving the thumbs up. So thank you for your answer. Um, we'll move on to the next question, which is by Matthew, um, what do you think the relationship between disaster time communication and normal time communication is? Mm -hmm. I can see a parallel with cases where media or scientists present new studies as truth, while a more nuanced presentation of new evidence and potential drawbacks may not be as exciting as outreach material. Do you think part of what we learned during disaster time communication can be transferred to scientific communication in general? Yes, I think I totally agree that uh, what we learn 
during crisis uh, situation or disaster situation can be applicable to many situations in a usual time. Actually, uh, yeah, preparing for, I think my, it's my opinion, but preparing for disaster is a process to make our uh, whole science society healthier. Because uh, when disaster is not a specific event, but an event that make the most vulnerable, uh, well, that make clear where, who is the most vulnerable, who is the most, uh, what is the most vulnerable part of our society, or what is the most uh, difficult situation, uh, difficult thing to communicate. So, I mean, through the uh, our communication during disaster, we may be we may get used to the situation where we do not have a correct answer or concrete answer. So train it's a really good uh, situation to train ourselves. Yes, Thank you. Right. And I asked a question, but I'll actually move on to some other questions from um, other participants of the conference first. So. Thank you very much for your presentation. I understand that being logical or good reasoning do not facilitate the communication between experts and the public, but wouldn't the public ultimately need logic or sound reasoning to make informed decisions? Mm -hmm. If so, how do you think one could gain these skills outside of the scientific process? Um, also, how do you think transparency and authority of a communicator, for example, Nobel laureate or a scientist play a role in communicating disastrous situations? Yeah, it's a really good question and difficult. Some, some, um, yeah, to some point, uh, difficult to answer because I think we need uh, common logic before we make communication because uh, without that logic, we can not be on the same table. So, but Actually, uh, through my experience, I uh, became, yeah, I think I, became, I become to think the logic, I think, is quite sometimes quite different of, in, of the logic the other people think. For example, logic among Asian people is sometimes different from that in European, uh, yeah people in European countries. So, so be, logic is a basic, to, uh, basic thing to make uh, good communication. But still, before talking about logic, we need to understand their own culture. So their life or their culture or what their value. Without that uh, knowledge, we may not uh, say this is the common logic. So <laughs> it's uh, yeah, ch chicken or egg question. <laughs> uh, knowing culture is still yeah more important than understanding logic. But at school, we can learn common logic uh, at school. Because school lecture is some uh, yeah homogeneous kind of homogeneous through the all over the world, so that's the role of uh, school teaching, I think. And another question: transparency and comprehensiveness, and trans yes, and uh, the uh, uh, sorry another question. But about the transparency and authority of the communicator. Yeah, uh, authority, yes. Uh, authority is also dif difficult to decide because, uh, yeah, I think that in, I agree that some in some topic, scientists or Nobel Prize winners have more correct answer than other people. But before we, we believe the uh, opinion, believe in their opinion, we should make clear why we weigh uh, their, some, someone's opinion 
should be weighed more on than the others. That uh, because they know more about that specific topic or because they know more about their life or they know about more about their culture. So if the reason why they that opinion should be weighed more on is clear, it would be better to listen to that authority's opinion. And transparency is uh, another problem uh, because many governments, especially Japanese government, say we always um, open uh, the information, our information, but that information is not always comprehensive. So transparency and the comprehensiveness is a two view of communication. So just transparency is not enough in many cases, especially in uh, crisis situations. So when we talk, talk about, uh, think about transparency, we should be, uh, we should consider the comprehensiveness at the same time. That's all. Thanks for the answer. and and. I, I really like the phrase you used in your talk about um, non-scientific logic, because I think that really captures the difference in the way that people make decisions. Um, we just have three minutes left, but I want to remind everyone that, that even if we don't get to your question, that the platform has all the questions on it, and um, hopefully Sayochi will respond to the questions that are unanswered, so please keep checking back. Um, the next question is, it is easy to compare job loss, economics, population deaths, and mental disorder logically. However, comparing stress or feelings quantitatively and logically is difficult. Of course, there should be some connection between medicine and psychology, but still the bridge between feelings and science is not so clear. Mm -hmm. What can we scientists do to bridge this gap? How about the general public? Actually, my answer is that scientists cannot bridge all these topics because we cannot measure as, uh, as that, uh, yeah, he mentioned uh, the, we cannot measure how, yeah, yeah, how uh, the, the volume of that impact. So what scientists, we scientists, should know our limitation. We cannot do everything. And that's why I uh, I don't call my communication as science communication, but life communication. That the feeling is what scientists should learn from the residents or the other people, and not we should uh, teach the residents. So that's the communication that uh, both direction of uh, knowledge exchange. Sometimes we scientists are really uh, responsible to all the health. So we try to uh, teach all the value to the residents. But we, need to, we may need to know we should learn from the residents to, uh, in such uh, part of risks. I think, is that the answer? Yeah, I think that answers. And um, if you think of anything else that you want to add, you know, feel free to join on the platform. I really appreciate you answering the questions in a in a written way on Chaos Storm. That's really nice for everyone. Um, so we're just at about time. So thank you very much for the Q and A session. And it seems like there's a lot more to talk about. I really encourage everyone to go watch uh, Ochi San's talk. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sai, and thank you. Thank you, Harrison. Um, very, very good indeed. Um, thank you both. And if I can just reiterate uh, exactly what uh, Harrison has just said, is that uh, we invite and encourage you uh, to be able to use KaiStorm. I'm just going to share my screen again. You'll. I won't do this more than uh, one more time, just so that um, you can see exactly what is happening on the uh, on the platform because we're keen to encourage you to um, uh, to capture your thinking as we go remember that we've got today's uh, agenda uh, we can look at uh, size 
Uh, Toby, just to interrupt you, you're sharing yeah. your Slack screen right now. Well, well isn't that interesting? Let see, me everyone's stop seeing that. all our organisational tips. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Let me do that now. Is that better, Emma? That's perfect. So there's says um, uh, page. Here are the questions. Do continue uh, the conversation here. That would be a really nice way of asking further questions. Remember that if you wish, you can look at her full presentation uh, as well. Now we want to move on to Yuri, um, uh, who, again, you can find his page on KaiStorm. There are already some really interesting questions here, and I'd ask you to do the same thing. Please do um, ask any further questions, capture them, continue the conversation here at the same time. Um, we'll play Yuri's uh, short video, and then Yuri, if that's all right, Harrison will uh, go through the Q&A. Emma, is that all right? Can we share the video? Yes, great. Thanks, Toby. Hello, everybody. My name is Yuri Sudo again and I am a science producer working at the NHK. I talked about uh, scientists and producers' happy marriage, how we can collaborate and how we can be collaborators. And I showed you the difference between a science producer and a bona fide news reporter, the difference, the timeline, the goal, and our role, which is very important to understand if we want to be collaborating together to communicate science to the public. So uh, I hope to see you again during the Q&A sessions and um, hopefully in the future, not so far away, that we can collaborate together on a new project. So see you around. Bye. Thanks for joining us today, Yuri Sudo. So um, I'll go ahead and get started reading some questions. Emily had a question, which is, Thanks for sharing the, the, the nice romantic story and she enjoyed learning about the role of the science producer. Given that time is many years ahead, how can you tell if the studies will be significant or not to society? As you mentioned at the time of production, the public might not be interested yet um, and the research results might not even be concluded. So how do you scan through the studies and kind of uh, decide which ones you wanna invest time in? What criteria and characteristics are you looking for? Um, okay. Hello, everybody. I'm Yuri again. And thank you, Harrison. Thank you, Emily, for the question. I tried to answer that um, with this, with this um, particular Kai storm. Uh, so I'm just going to um, kind of um, go over that again. Well, um, when we start doing a, a, a feature like film or a, a very special program, special science film, it's uh, oftentimes it's it's like a year, two years, or three years ahead when we go on bright broadcast. So in, at that point, we do not know the outcome of the research itself. But um, it it doesn't matter for us if it is uh, published in in Nature or not. It's the it's 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 the story about how the scientists tackled the question, rather. So. It, to answer the question, we we do not have to know the scientific significance. We just have to find that story where um, passion is involved, or the challenge of the of the of of the scientists. Um, does that answer the question? Yeah, I think that answers the question nicely, and I think that that's an important reminder that behind all the, the rational science, there's a story about the, the people involved with it and kind of what their thought process is. Yeah, so um, we don't actually have that kind of a, a, a story. Um, it's a process of building the story together. So we don't have a conclusion when we start collaborating. It's just um, how we can find that story together, uh, which develops in due course. Great. We'll move on to the next question. Um, thanks for the great talk. I sometimes find it hard to find the significance of basic science to the general society. 
for example, scanning the pyramids is really interesting and fascinating for me personally, because I used to love pyramids as a little kid. However, how would you convince the general public that this is interesting? Finding a new room won't immediately impact our daily lives. Um, well, again, I think, um, well, science is not just for the scientists. Science should be understandable for everybody. And science is not just for the people who are engaged in that professionally. So um, the, beauty, the beauty of science or the, the exciting excitement of science, I, if we can break that down into uh, more kind of uh, easy to understand bits and pieces, which is um, oftentimes more kind of uh, like ex excitement or the passion that, that I just mentioned, um, then it doesn't matter what kind, what um, field of science that you're working in. It's um, just about the ultimate question that you have, or the, or rather, I I I believe that every everybody as a scientist ha has that kind of passion when they when you first started your career. Uh, the ultimate question or the the um, the dream that you have, the dream dreamt when you were a little child, maybe. So if we can go back to that or add that kind of um, nuance in the in the story, it's it's not difficult to um, apply it to any kind of field, even if it's basic science or if it's a science that uh, a producer like me cannot understand fully. Uh, if you can make it to a more human skill story, and that is very important when we when we think about the like um, STEM education, it's when you tell when you're trying to tell stories to to children, the children don't necessarily have to understand fully what you're what you're um, studying, but if they can grasp that that excitement that you have, or that you enjoy yourself, then it becomes a story that can resonate to a broader pub, um, viewer, I guess. Thanks, I think that answered the question really nicely. Um, two of the questions are kind of along the same lines, which go in the more practical direction of kind of what, what can scientists do to generate documents like documentaries like the one that you presented and kind of how can scientists become acquainted with science producers like yourself um, so what's that process like and, and how, as scientists, can we become involved with these types of programs? Um, well, this is my first time I attended the, the LC symposium. So I'm not sure how, um, what the, the subject was for the previous years, but I'm very, very glad that you have this um, science and society theme for, for this year. And in the media, especially in the US, science communications has, um, communication has become more important than ever um, with this um, kind of the uh, polarized situation of the society to regain tr scientists trust, the public's trust uh, for science. And so these um, reaching out to each other is, has become a kind of a trend, I guess. The, the producers community has been re trying to reach out to the scientists, uh, not just uh, as like an independent producer, but as a community. We're trying to connect the, the two, two um, indus industries together. And um, so these kind of symposiums or a, a gathering that which is much, much smaller, that would be the first point of contact. Uh, of course, we are trying to read um, the, the publications that you have made, but these are, you know, as I said, the more uh, hum, human kind of aspect of your research is, might be the goal of our, of our, um, of our uh, film. So to meet in person like this, even virtually is very important. Uh, that, what was the other question that you asked? Kind of just, yeah, how can scientists get in touch with people like you that are producing these really interesting um, films or, or documentaries well, uh, about? Obviously you can reach out to me now. <laughs> and I guess there are some uh, 
some members of the, the media in, in this in this symposium as well. So yeah, try try to reach out, try to set up a a personal meeting if you can. But oftentimes these kind of symposiums are the best way to have a chat during coffee breaks. Yeah, and I, normally um, LC symposia aren't focused on necessarily the relationship between science and society, or at least normally that's not the kind of direct purpose of the conference. So this is something different this year, and it is really great to be able to connect um, with people and different expertise and, and communicating and expertise with, with policies and media and all this kind of stuff. So I'm really glad that we're able to have you and other speakers such as yourself with this kind of expertise. Um, we'll move on to another question, um, which is how do you keep a balance of scientific accuracy and impact um, as a content when you produce a program. So how do you balance scientific importance and social interest when you choose a topic? I think you touched on this a little bit with, with kind of going into personal stories, uh, but still it's really interesting to think about kind of how much do you emphasize the correct science and get into the details of, of stuff which might be more expert level versus high level. Um, and so these questions also matter to scientists when they make press releases, for example. And how do, how do you think about this kind of balance? Mm -hmm. um, again, I tried to answer that on, on the platform, but um, uh, well, misinformation is, uh, it's, it's become a, a very huge topic for us. Uh, it's um, affecting every corner of today's society in science in particular. Um, so it, and it's very hard to counter misinformation, I guess. So uh, more and more, we try to think about how to um, strengthen the public's trust in science, as I said before. And in order to do that, if we're going to, well, there are lots of media. And if you want to call the, the film uh, a science film, it's, oh, it's very important for us to, uh, to um, have the accuracy, the scientific accuracy. So um, I think that was... Uh, a question when I was telling the story about uh, the impact on the public, like a more um, uh, um, like sensationalism, but we are, try to be very, very um, uh, careful in that. And we normally have the, the scientists themselves to do the chat, the fact checks, but we also um, consult a, a different scientist to do uh, a fine, fine, uh, fact check as well. S yeah. Cool. Yeah, that that's really important. I think to to scientists, of course, is making sure that you don't mislead people or make them think that something which we know to be false, um, you know make sure it's pre not presented as, as a true fact. Um, so we just have one more minute. I have a maybe a brief question for myself, which is, do you have to fight for scientific uh, content to be produced at NHK? Or is this kind of a decision which is made at a higher level? Does, does NHK ever debate mm -hmm. about reducing scientific programming um, in order to, to make more of some other, maybe less scientific programming? Mm. Um... I, I, I think it's the same, uh, like our, uh, we are a huge, uh, we are a public broadcaster, so we are a huge entity. We also have like drama producers and the drama producers have to fight to get the budget as well. So I think it's just, um, it's just a normal how we can get more budget, uh, but it's not because uh, the, as a corporation, we're looking for more science pro pro projects or more entertainment. It's not working like that at the moment. I guess I find that reassuring at some level to know that I get the impression, for example, in, in US programming that, you know, the, the less scientific you make something, the, the higher the ratings are. Um, I knew someone associated with the Big Bang, for instance, and they talked about how as they kind of reduced the amount of science incorporated, it became more and more popular. So that's kind of what led me to this question. But um, Thank you so much for, for answering questions and, and we hope you'll continue to be involved on Chaos Storm and answer any other questions that come up.
Thank you very much, too. Thank you. And thank you, Yuri. Thank you, Harrison. Uh, let us move straight on, if we may. It would be lovely to continue this really lovely Q&A. Please remember, capture the conversation on Kai Storm, because we're moving on to listen to Kumiko uh, in conversation with Harrison. She has her own page on uh, Kai Storm. If you have any questions, please put it there. Um, Emma, are we OK to play Kumiko's summary video? We are indeed. One moment. And efforts I introduced a device. In my talk, I presented how to make a conference inclusive. The tips and efforts I introduced are divided into two groups. Number one, you can do it without extra cost or with low cost materials. For example, you can use preferred gender pronouns and color communication labels on the name tag. Number two, some efforts and materials need extra cost or special techniques. It is challenging to select which supports are essential. Inclusivity and diversity are important because everybody has a right to learn science and also can be beneficial to produce a good research outcome. Let's try to implement inclusive activities. Hi, um, thanks for joining us, Kumiko Usura Sato. Hi. Yes, do you um, hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Good. And very cool background behind you as well. <laughs> Thank you so much. So we have a few questions up on KI Storm, but there's still room for more questions if people want to add any of their questions. So just to get us started off, um, in your experience, uh, Hiro asks, how does the cost in both budget and human power differ quantitatively between common uh, conferences and more inclusive ones? Do you think that the difference can be covered by our bottom-up effort only, or do we need more systematic support from the community? Well, thank you so much for a very good question and very hard to answer. Um, it's challenging for me to answer this question because it's hard to evaluate quanti quantitatively uh, between human power and budget. Actually, uh, I am a LOC chair of this conference, and uh, one of the role of LOC is to uh, get grant from other organizations. Actually, at first we tried to find some appropriate existing, existing, existing grants inside of Japan, but uh, we couldn't find any appropriate one. So we asked our director of NOJ to write a letter to many research organization inside and outside of Japan related to astronomy and astrophysics. And fortunately, their expectation is huge to us. So we receive many support, uh, financial support from many organizations. So um, after the symposium, we, we, uh, so we, we, we could spend enough money for captioning or other supports. So, um, yeah, for if 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 we can find a very good partner, maybe in kind or financial with uh, in, uh, so both in kind in, in kind support and financial support, uh, I think it, it really works. But it is very challenging to evaluate how effective we can use the budget and also human power. Did I answer your question? I think that that gets at the question. Um, so does it seem kind of like a problem in terms of getting policymakers on board with spending money on inclusivity? And, and I think what you're saying is it's hard to kind of measure exactly how much of an effect it makes or, or how you compare against including different groups of people. Is that? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I think how to evaluate how, how, how can we evaluate our symposium? Uh, is, it, uh, 
it is cost effective or not cost effective is very challenging. Maybe, uh, so this, our symposium is just the beginning. This is very first symposium by International Astronomical Union. So maybe if we can continue the second, third um, inclusive conferences, we can make some uh, guidelines and uh, evaluation uh, tips. Then we can, we can brush up how to make the conference cost effective and uh, make it easier. So from a practical standpoint, are there any specific grants that, that you know about that people can apply to, to make sure that they have money to, to make their conferences as inclusive as possible? Actually for our side, we couldn't find any existing uh, grant. That's why we asked many research institutes inside and outside of uh, Japan. So it still seems like it's a problem, kind of a, a systemic problem where people need to realize that this is an important thing to spend money yeah, on. And, I, I and think make so. Sure so fund. the very important thing is to increase awareness and uh, how the import, uh, how inclusive environment is important for the community and research, in research field. Thanks. Um, we have another question, which is by Pete. It was very interesting to see the many ways in which we can make presentations more inclusive. Thank you. Thank however, you so for or, however, for organizers of a conference, it may be difficult to choose which of the many diversity audiences to address. There are dozens of ways to do this. Uh, do you have a list of possibilities and perhaps also suggestions of priorities? Very good question. This is, this is, that, that, that is how we struggle. This, that is what we struggled. It is very difficult to draw a line because when we, uh, everybody is welcome to our conference. So we have to consider many uh, diverse requests and uh, it's cost, uh, it should be cost effective. So um, as I presented in my talk, there are two kinds of supports. One is uh, less, less, uh, less cost, uh, costless and easy to do, like uh, use the uh, inclusive color, color universal design, uh, use universal design color or make their sun self, sun self letter like this one. Other one is uh, unit, unit budget for real time captioning or braille labels or something. So maybe from the beginning, why don't you start from uh, easy to start things like colors and letters or something. But it is very, very challenging for us to prioritize which is most effective, um, what it, oh, which is most effective and the most, ef most important. Thank you very much. Thanks for the answer. Um, I guess from a related aspect, I have a question on do you feel like online conferences, which COVID have, has caused to become kind of very common, uh, do you think that these online conferences are, are easier or harder to make inclusive? And what aspects specifically do you think are, are easier or harder? Thank you so much. I think both sides easier and harder, but in total, I feel easier because uh, we don't, uh, no, no, nobody is worried about travel expenses. So, um, yeah, so everybody in the world can attend without any travel expenses. And now I have attended many inclusive conferences in the US or in Europe from Japan. And in this, con in, in this kind of conferences, real time uh, sign language interpreter also attended. And everybody knows Zoom meeting and some deaf and hard to hearing people watch the real time captioning and understand. In addition, many, uh, many organizers use closed caption. So um, many Zoom users use some, uh, today we don't see this icon, but some organizers set up CC, maybe closed caption icon. So if you click this CC button at the bottom of Zoom toolbox, uh, you can see the real-time captioning. So uh, I already explained in my talk 
finding low cost real time capturing is very, very challenging. But maybe I think this problem is solved thanks to Zoom. Uh, when I attended some uh, international conference or international meeting and click CC, uh, cross caption icon, I can see pretty good real time captioning. So uh, I think from hearing impaired people attending a conference is easier in this COVID-19. On the other hand, I'm not sure about the blind and the visually impaired people. Um, actually, I think, I believe most visually, visually impaired researchers use read aloud uh, software so they can understand. But if some blind people prefer touching by Braille, uh, Braille on paper, so touching is very, very challenging in the COVID-19 pandemic situation. So I am not sure how visually impaired people think uh, about this online meeting. Yeah, that's really that's a really good point. And it goes back to the question about kind of how do you how do you decide who to make a conference inclusive for because certain things are going to be better for some audiences and, and worse for other audiences. And I thought you had a really nice um, point related to the closed captioning that you made during your talk as well, which is that even though uh, it seems like maybe closed captioning is becoming easier to do, it mm -hmm. still is, is not that great if your accent isn't a native accent for English, for example, or if you're speaking another language. So it seems like there's, it, there's better tools, but still definitely room for improvement. Yeah, actually. So uh, ple please do not rely on <laughs> cross caption. So this is, a, a, this is a kind of alternative tool. So maybe what we should do is uh, to create understandable uh, slides and presentation uh, as I presented in my talk. And then uh, additionally, if you can use a cross caption tool, it should be uh, great. Thanks. Um, we just have two more minutes. I have one more question, which I had been asked on KI Storm, but that I was thinking about during your talk, which is you mentioned that this inclusivity conference you had, you actually had to exclude half the people that applied just because too many people applied. And I'm part of another conference that I help organize. We're, we're having similar problems recently where we're used to organizing this small intimate conference, but it's grown and we don't wanna exclude people, but we also don't wanna change kind of the feel of the conference. So how do you kind of address these issues? Very good point. Actually, we had to exclu exclude some people because uh, our room capacity is only 100 people. And uh, actually more than 200 people were interested in. So we are so sorry to exclude more than 100 people. So the alternative uh, method is live, live streaming. Uh, for uh, people who could not attend the meeting. But um, so our, our conference was held before COVID-19 and we were very careful to, for the live st streaming because some presenters uh, do, do not feel comfortable for live streaming. That's why we discussed this issue, but we decided not to implement, uh, not to provide live, live streaming because some people were happy to discuss some sensitive issue in the very uh, small room or something. So it's a balance. Um, uh, so, so the live streaming, uh, so, so the participants prefer live streaming to reach more people or closed session. So, so we, we, we should know which, uh, which is better for our conference. And maybe we need to write down our philosophy or our objectives on the website for the announcement. Thanks, thanks for that answer. Thank um, you so much. Unfortunately, we're at about time today, but thank you so much for, for joining the Q&A session. And, and like I mentioned to our previous speakers, we'd be delighted if you could continue to join us on KI Storm during the week and answer any questions that may pop up. Thank you so much. And thank you, Kimiko uh, and Harrison. Again, we have our last Q&A speaker now. Uh, it would uh, be wonderful if you could uh, have a look at 
Hitoshi's um, page on Kai Storm. Uh, he has, again, full-length video, which you can continue to look at after the event, and his summary video. Uh, Emma's going to play that in a second, but remember, you can continue the conversation capturing these thoughts. I don't know if you've been looking at the chat that's been going on, stimulated by what we just heard from Kumiko. So uh, one of the great advantages about having a platform is that if English isn't your first language, you can still take time to capture things uh, in writing. So please do put things down if you're uh, if you're not as confident in English as, uh, as colleagues. So keep using the chat, but do use KaiStorm as well to capture your thoughts. Uh, Hitoshi, welcome. Harrison um, will introduce you in a second. Emma, can you play uh, Hitoshi's summary? Hello, this is Hitoshi Murayama, who used to be one of the WPI directors, just like Elsie. And I'd like to give a, a short talk about how to get support for your science from my own experience. And I have been actually fairly successful in raising funds from the government and have managed to build this institute, which became sort of on paper comparable to great places like MIT, Stanford and Princeton. And uh, I also had to work a lot with administrators to create a video like this one and also garnered a lot of public support uh, based on various public outreach events. So I'd like to share some of the things I learned on the way and what I think is my self-assessment on what are the factors that went into in the successes myself. Okay, enjoy. Thanks for joining us today, Hitoshi Murayama. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, so we only have a few questions posted on KI Storm right now. Um, I think more people have, have still been watching your talk, but we'll start with the first question that we have here by Hiro. So he says, thank you for the great talk. Do you have any thoughts on how science itself rather than specific projects can become better supported by governments? Another keynote speaker from the US region uh, presented that the faction, fraction of budget the US government paid for science has been decreasing since the 1960s. In Japan, the support is shifting toward competing grants rather from stable money, for example, management grants for university. I would like to hear your thoughts on how these situations and what the individual scientists and community can do to improve them. Yeah, that's a very good question. And if I can, I'd like to share some of the slides to talk about these points. So one thing about the US funding, I have in the US system, I'm a professor in Berkeley, uh, really has to do with the fact that Cold War ended. The, the government supported science primarily as a way of, as a nurturing grounds for people to eventually develop weapons and contribute to the military. And that was a basic motivation why US really expanded science funding right after World War II. So we physicists had been sort of the homework uh, of people who produced atomic weapons. And being in Berkeley, but originally from Japan, that gives me a very awkward feeling about it because the Berkeley really spawned Oppenheimer that went to Los Alamos and built atomic bombs, which eventually dropped in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But that's the history. So once the Cold War is over, the US government started to lose interest in, in spending, uh, uh, investing in science. So that's the reason why it declined in the case of US. And in Japan, I think the reason for this shift is rather this, I would say, misguided perception that the reason why US has been such a big powerhouse in science is based on the fact that the successful universities are private and they're, they're not getting much public funds and they uh, have charged incredibly high tuition and, and that's the model for success. And, and that's of course not true elsewhere in the world. For example, German universities are excellent, but they don't charge a cent to the university. This is all supported fully by public, but nonetheless, there is this perception, if you look at the Times Higher uh, Education ranking and so on, all the universities tend to be either in US or UK, English speaking uh, countries, where you have to pay a hefty tuition uh, to get into the colleges. So that, uh, I'm afraid, led to this misguided concept that universities in higher education don't need public support. And, and that seems to be happening, not just in Japan, but throughout the, uh, the, uh, the world. And even Germany went that route once and they actually backtracked, fortunately. But anyway, so that's, that misguided perception does seem to exist. So that's part of the problem. And having said this, and here's some data on how much each government is spending on science as a fraction of GDP. 
And this is all OECD nations, but it's interesting to see that Korea spends the most amount of fraction of GDP into uh, 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 science and technology. It's 1% of GDP. Japan is a half of that. And, and also interesting to see this lineup, starting with the Korea at the top, then come Austria, Sweden, Denmark, Norway, Finland. So these are not necessarily countries that are viewed as the powerhouse in science, but they spend a lot of money into this. And then comes sort of a, you know, the usual sus suspects, Switzerland, Germany, France, USA, they're all countries very strong in science. But Japan is way down here. And for some reason, UK is even further behind. So how much science output there is, is not necessarily linked to the spending by the government. That's one message I get. And another question is, how did Korea manage to get this science funding boosted to 1% level? And I was once visiting KAIST as a university in Korea, one of the major universities, uh, Korean uh, Institute in, in Science and Technology. And I was invited to meet the president there. When I asked this question, the president claimed that he himself was the person who managed to convince the government to boost the funding. And that argument was based on purely economic terms. He somehow came up with analysis that how much government spends on science and technology research translates to economic output. And in order for Korea to compete on economic scale, you have to spend this much money in science and technology. And apparently that worked, if, if I believe him. That of course is a dangerous argument because that might actually erode funding for humanities and sociology and so on. So uh, it may be a dangerous argument to begin with, but nonetheless, that's apparently what he did, according to him. I also had an opportunity to visit Sweden and, and had a, a chance to speak to the president of the Swedish Royal Academy and asked the following question. So as you see here, again, Sweden is putting a lot of public funds into the science and technology R&D. So my question was, well, especially in basic science, it's, it's common throughout the world. It doesn't depend on which country you are in. So if you're waiting for some great technological discovery, that doesn't have to have to happen in your country because you can just go ahead and grab it and use it. So there can be an argument that you don't need to spend national money on, on the cutting edge basic science. You can just take it from elsewhere. And, and then the president actually gave me a counter argument to this, which was actually very interesting. So he basically said, if a nation is not investing in basic science at the time of destructive technological breakthrough, nobody in the country would understand its significance. Therefore, nobody can take it up to develop it further. And therefore, nobody will be able to find applications of the breakthrough and you miss the boat. And that's the argument the president has been making to the government, he says, and that seems to be working at least in a Swiss context. So I think that we collectively as the intellectuals need to come up with a good argument that works for a particular country. And it's clear that Japan has been failing in this regard. And I have been trying out this kind of argument whenever I had an opportunity to talk to politicians at LDP and mixed officials and so far nothing really changed. And part of the problem is that the, uh, if you look at the, uh, the platform of LDP before the elections, which is called Manifesto in Japan, they claim they would like to achieve 1% of GDP in science and technology expenditure. So I thought that meant to be doubling the expenditure. It turns out the Ministry of Finance people are very smart. They came up with a trick of computing the government spending in a different way from OECD does. And apparently that's already at the 1% level. So they don't need to boost it anymore. So again, this is the, the way the discussion is being happening in a Japan, Japanese context. We have to break this barrier somehow. And I don't know how yet, but we have to really think hard about how we can make the overall envelope of the science funding in Japan go up. Otherwise we'll be all suffocated down the line. Yeah, thank you for that. That's interesting insight and in comparison between other countries. Um, I guess related to that, I had a question, which is, you know, I'm familiar with the US system and becoming familiar with the Japanese system of funding. And it seems like in the Japanese system, um, it's much harder to get money for personnel here as compared to the US and NSF, you can, you know, write a grant and it'll pay the money to fund a postdoc or a graduate student. That seems much less common in Japan, which means that 
it's a much bigger deal, I think, when an institute like ELSI, for example, loses the big government grants that they have because it, it's really hard to recoup the cost of, of the personnel. Um, kind of, what do you think that the solution should be for this? Yeah, no, this is like a deep rooted issue. And part of the thing is that Japanese labor system is much more protective for employees compared to the US system, which is really uh, 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 the uh, uh, sort of a general system to employers. So in Japan, in Japanese system, hiring somebody comes with much bigger responsibility and the funding agencies don't want to take that responsibility. That's the way I see it. Of course, I don't know the real reason for this, but that's at least one major difference I see in two different systems. So very recently, as you probably know, the Japanese law changed that if you are employed by a university for more than 10 years, you can claim you are a permanent employee. And that makes it very difficult to people continue to be hired on soft money because that becomes a liability to the university. So that makes it probably even more difficult to have a system of more active hiring of the soft money employees and researchers in the Japanese system. So there's a, something systematic going on. So it's not just the policy, it's the overall system of the society. Thanks. And we just have a few minutes left, but um, since I don't see any other questions, I'll pivot to the other half of this question that I have, which is, um, it's always sexier for a government to start a new program and say, you know, as a policymaker, I started this program than it is to continue to make investments in existing programs, even when the return on investment may be better from continuing to make investments rather than to end something and start something new. How do you uh, get policymakers to keep investing in things that, that have already started at, instead of, you know, trying to start and stop their own new things? Yeah, so that's also a very good question. And uh, uh, it's definitely true that the system, if I understand correctly, among the government officials is that if they start something new and if that turns out successful, they get reward and get promoted. So that's the, the brownie points they are after. Um, so that's a very difficult th thing to change, I'm afraid. But at the same time, we also need to work to educate the policymakers. So when, when I had actually a chance to speak at LDP uh, to this, uh, uh, the science and technology working group within the party, I made the kind of argument I just mentioned earlier and, it, and, and argued for basically doubling the budget. And the chair of the working group told me that it's possible to do that. But immediately he added the comment, but if much of those funding goes to basically sort of base funding of the university, where university can do whatever they want with it without any strings attached, then that's a waste, waste, uh, wasteful spending, he said. So there seems to be deep rooted perception that letting universities uh, use the money the way they, they, they see fit is actually not an effective use of money. And if there's an evidence for it, I don't know, but the perception seems to exist. So we need to come up with a way of demonstrating that uh, giving university liberty would actually lead to even more efficient way of using funds. And, and that demonstration is probably lacking. Then we can fight the battle on that front. Also, I try to argue that the science and technology spending is an investment in the future. And just like any investment is about, you need to have a portfolio. The part of the portfolio has to be long-term investment and part of the portfolio needs to be short-term returns. And you need to have a combination of all of them to come up with a healthy system of investment. And that's something we need to make sure that the policymakers understand. Thanks very much for that answer. And that about brings us to time. So thank you for joining our Q&A session today, Murayama-san. And thank we you hope that you'll continue. Yeah, well, and we, we hope that you'll continue to be involved in on the KI Storm platform when you have time to poke around and answer questions. So thank you. Okay, we'll do. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. And thank you to all our guest speakers and to Harrison for moderating so beautifully. That is the end of the Q&A session right now. Now, all of us have spent far too long on Zoom this last year, and we encourage you to take a break now. This is not to leave us. So leave Zoom running, let you just mute yourself and turn off your video, but please 
take a moment, get some tea, a glass of water, stretch your legs, get outside if you poss possibly can, because we need to stay refreshed for the next session. We're going to have some mini breakouts. So the plan is that we will take a 15 minute break now. We'll start again promptly at half past the hour, that is half past three, and we'll then give you instructions about how to get into mini breakouts and have rich conversations with colleagues. 15 minutes, we'll see you at half past and welcome you back then. Thank you. 